Charmed to see everyone. Welcome back to Star Player One. I'm Brand Knight. And I'm Shiryuki. Today we're playing Code Realize Book Kit of Rainbows. Last time we left off, Shiryuki has met up with the Queen of England. And we're trying to just uh, come up with a plan to how to beat Nemo. Nemo has his ship in the air and he's saying, Give me Shiryuki, or I'm going to keep bombing London and destroy it all. Because Isaac sees potential in Nemo. Because I. Zick is concerned for him. <laughs> look, look! See the sky filled with the light of destruction? Please, give me a sign, Master Isaac! Nemo raises his arms and shouts, striking a figure that is both ridiculous while at the same time sad. Intense combat unfolds in the air beyond the windows of the nav navigational. navigational bridge. But even this battle in the sky will soon come to an end. Britain will fall to the might and the mind of one mad scientist. Yeah, he's, he's a little insane. Yeah. Chapter 12. I only believe there's 13 chapters, so... We're at the finish line. And I didn't read what the, what the chapter title was. I didn't either. <laughs> chapter <forget>. 12. <laughs> <laughs> It's been... Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's been two days since the battle in the skies above London when the British airborne knights suffered a brutal defeat. Ooh, so we lost. Victoria apologized to her entire nation, saying that she had underestimated the power of the Natalis. She also published a statement in every newspaper saying that she would bring down the Natalis no matter what it cost. Furthermore, she announced an evacuation advisor to the citizens of London in order to minimize damage from any large battles. Later battles. Later battles. As for Twilight with their possible connection with the Nautilus, just as investigations began, its members all reportedly disappeared without a trace. The organization comprised of elite agents was able to eliminate all records of themselves to make themselves untrackable. Victoria is extremely angry at the fact, but it seems she has decided to prioritize an, the upcoming battle with the Nautilus. However, after the initial battle, the Nautilus disappeared completely. Huh. Victoria is currently using her troops to pinpoint its location. We are given a task as well. As the people who are most knowledgeable about Nemo, we are staying in the palace. We have been a Assisting in devising an operation to bring down the Nautilus down, or bring the Nautilus down. Ooh. Tomorrow I will present myself on the stage of battle as a decoy. Victor and Saint Germain have arranged to be my guards. Lubin, Van Helsing, and Impe will need to sneak on board the Nautilus somehow and destroy it from within. Oh, I like those three together. That's a that's a good, that's a winning team. <laughs> as everyone. Busies. Busies themselves in planning and preparing for the mission. I noticed that I haven't been seen uh, Empe around. We haven't seen our lover. No. <laughs> no. I try not to think about it too much at first, but I keep catching myself looking for Empe. She needs her man, Shiryuki. Yeah. She needs her man. No. <laughs> I keep searching for him, and at one point I find myself outside the palace. The night breeze is a bit chilly on my skin, and the moon's light is clear as always. As I look around, I see Impey leaving the palace on its own. Oh, Impey, wait! I call out to him, and he turns around and smiles at me. No. <laughs> What's the matter? Are you getting lonely because you haven't seen me in a while? Not exactly. He's hit the nail on the head and my voice becomes quieter. A anyway, where are you going? Impe is the only person who knows the Nautilus and understands the details of how it stays aloft. He's cr crucial to the mission's planning. Aren't they having a meeting right now? Don't you need to be there? Well, yeah. We're a little stuck, so I wanted to cool off for a while. I asked everyone for permission, of course. I see. 
So I think I'm going to go for a little walk. See you later. Impe waves to me and starts walking, and I automatically walk after him. Um, do you mind if I come with you? Like a date? All right. Uh... No. No. <laughs> he stops when I call out to him. I don't mind at all, but it's not going to be that all that exciting, you know? That's fine. It's just when I'm alone, I start thinking about things that aren't important. I want to go with you. No, I don't. <laughs> it's like her, her, her soul is conflict and whatever. <laughs> she, I think she has like a split personality disorder. But if you'd rather be alone. <laughs> no way. Walks are much more fun with some company. And that company is my beloved. Then all more so. For a while, Empey and I walk through the city together. There is no one in the streets. Everyone has been evacuated. Tonight, with Nemo's deadline approaching tomorrow, the only ones remaining in the city are with the military or us. Since evacuation happened so suddenly, the lights in many buildings have been left on. The only sound I can hear is our own footsteps. I feel Empey's presence more strongly and closer than usual. Soon, Empe stops in the middle of a rubble-filled street and stands there in a daze. This is where the Nautilus bombed. Right. It's a scar in this world left by Nemo, and by my own invention. I listen to Empe as I look around us. The only thing that the cold light of the moon shows us are crumbling buildings and char charred. charred walls. All I see are slightly sinister things like the, these. Even the breeze carries with it an unpleasant scent of burned things. They were saying that the bodies of the victims were taken elsewhere. Impe suddenly breaks the silence. His expression looks hazy. It looks pretty bad here. and I heard many of the corpses were in terrible condition. They can't find people to claim them. They don't want to leave the bodies here at the risk of spreading disease, so they're going to bury all at once. They're going to be buried all at once. Impe Impe's voice sounds like he is speaking from a distant place. Then, Impe stares up at the ruined skyline. What's the matter, Impe? I start to feel uneasy as I watch Impe standing in silence. Impe laughs a little with a hint of self... Deprecation. Deprecation. It's just, I was thinking that if I hadn't suggested that we go find Nemo, none of this would have happened. Shiroki, your life wouldn't have been put in danger either. I know apologizing is useless, but I'm sorry. Are you apologizing to me or to the victims? Hmm, they both. Impe says this in a daze. At the very least, you don't have to apologize to me. I take full responsibility for my own actions. You did nothing wrong. And none of us could have imagined this outcome. We need to look ahead instead of regretting the past and deal with this. Empe looks at me and gently strokes my hair. No! <laughs> Just a simple act like this makes me stiffen up and I can feel my cheeks getting hot. Oh, no! Gosh, and... No! Wh what? I was just thinking, you're such a trooper. Thank you for making me feel better. You're right, there's no time to waste regretting things. Empe looks at me and smiles. But a smile looks forced to me for some reason. This makes me sad. No. <laughs> Times like this, I'm not sure if I should feel sad or angry. Are you angry at Nemo for what he's done? I mean, he used my invention for something horrible. I'm definitely frustrated and want to stop him. But I really can't bring myself to hate him. I just keep thinking, I shouldn't have done that or that. Impe smiled as trouble. Nemo used your invention to kill a number of people. You have every right to be mad. No, you should be mad. Impe tells me that he thinks the same thing, then scratches his cheek. <laughs> oh yeah. On a different topic, Deli actually already knows that I'm a vampire. R really? The sudden change in subject and this unexpected revel 
Lation catch me off guard. Impe nods. Um, it was right around the time he started living with us at the mansion. Dahlia was the one who came to me. He saw my physical capabilities and asked me point blank if I was a vampire. A slight breeze blows through Empe's hair. <laughs> Beneath the moonlight, Empe looks like he might fade away. I wonder why. He asked me to join him in secret to get vengeance for our people. Vengeance? He's talking about the vampire war two years ago? The British army almost completely wiped out the vampires. Van Helsing was part of, that, of the campaign, and I heard that he killed Deli's parents. He said, didn't they kill your family and those you care for too? Someday all, all our survivors will wipe out humanity together. He really said that? When I first met Deli, his curses against Van Helsing are still fresh in my memory. Well, at the very beginning, he doesn't bring up at all these days. Don't you think he's looking kinder too? I bet Dilly's a lot has a lot to think about. I look at Empe once again. He is a vampire who survived the war. It wouldn't be strange at all if he harbored a deep seated angry towards humans just like Delhi. When he asked me to join him in his revenge, I declined. And Delhi got so mad. <laughs> he punched me a few times, full force. That hurt, I thought I might die. Why? Empe looks at me puzzled. I heard that so many vampires were killed. Shouldn't you be angry that so many of your friends were murdered? That's the same thing Dally said. I told him. There's something I really wanted to do. And I still feel the same way. What did you want to do? Dally asked me that too. So I told him. And he punched me again. Then he said to stop kidding around. So, what is it you want? Well, if he says to be with you. No, no. <laughs> oh, hmm? Oh, you know, the thing I talk about pretty much on a daily basis. No! Or maybe just go to the moon. I hope it's that. <laughs> yes! Okay, we're safe! <laughs> Empe points up at the night sky. I want to go to the moon. <laughs> it seems like such a bizarre reason to decline and an an invitation to take revenge. But I can sort of understand why Deli would get mad. I had no intention intention of negating what Deli was trying to accomplish. But I guess nothing really matters to me except for reaching the moon. You want to go there there that much? Impe smiles and nods. His eyes looking straight ahead don't look like he is joking at all. Why do you feel that strongly about it? That's a good question. His eyes draw me in so strongly that I can't help but ask about it. I feel faint. No. <laughs> Why are you going to such great lengths to take back your gravity... Uh, elevator. Elevator. Elevator? Elevator. Elevator. Something like that. Why are you here at all? I want to know so much more about you. No, I don't. I want Lupin. I can show you the world. <laughs> <laughs> I see. My beloved must know that there's no way I can keep it from her. But in exchange, you do one thing I ask of you. What do you say? Deal? No. <laughs> don't do it. <laughs> All right. If you tell me about your past, I'll do whatever you say. Boo. I, I, just a general note, you obviously never say that to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're so easy to convince. Is that bad? It's not good at all, Shiroki. You need to be more cautious. Men are wolves, after all. You're not a wolf. You're a vampire. <laughs> what if I'm a werewolf? I can't keep myself from giggling at Impe's joke. Ha ha ha. <laughs> well, we're genuine. <laughs> it's not that I'm not cautious. I just let my guard down because it's you. <laughs> takes on her walls. I know you never do anything to hurt me. That's true. Empe stares at me and I stare back. Our gazes are entwined, then Empe smiles. The smile is much more mature than what I'm used to seeing on him. It's probably just going to bore you. I'm sure I'll find anything you want to tell me about interesting. Empe smiles grimly. 
Well, if that's the case, I guess I'll tell you about my pass. Impey sits down on a large pile of rubble and begins talking. He speaks of his past matter of fact... What the... Factly. Factly, in a sort of general... Gentle, yet slightly... Melancholic... 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 <laughs> Melancholic tone. Okay, I'm just gonna go with that. I'm not even gonna try. A serious tone. <laughs> <laughs> there. We can't say the word. We'll just tell you what another one could be a simile. It is a very long and very sad story. This is the exact same picture. He goes, uh, yeah, I guess it's an impact. It goes way back to when I was a kid. My parents died when I was little. And I guess my parents didn't really have a good relationship with the people around us. I was treated pretty much like a nuisance. I was passed around to a number of different relatives, but none of them ended up taking me in. In the end, I built myself a shack outside the village and managed to get it on by my own. I don't blame them. I was always a pretty gloomy kid. You'd probably be super put off if you saw how I used to be. Is that me? Yeah. Impey's <laughs> story continues. I mean, the people in my village should have sympathy for me. They did me a minimum amount of food to survive. I developed skills to feed myself so that life wasn't too tough. The forest around the village was rich in resources. And once I got the hang of hunting and gathering, I had no trouble finding food. But I was all alone. I didn't have any outside interests, didn't have any friends, and my parents were all dead. I spent those days and days, and my memories of those times are pretty hazy. I didn't talk much either, so when I did try from time to time, my voice didn't always work. That's pretty much all I remember. Oh, but... There was one thing I liked. The moon. I loved the moon. When I looked at it, I could feel it's cooling and soothing. I could feel it cooling and soothing my emotions. I would just stare at the moon whenever it was out, never tired of the sight. One day, I saw some kids running by my shack. I heard them saying that something about going to see a monster that the humans had created. Apparently, that's all anyone was talking about in the village. Is that where he saw the train? I wonder. Uh, uh. Oh, I told you this before. Impey questions. Impey's question brings me back to reality, and I nod. You follow the other kids and saw a locomotive. Hi. Impey nods. Yeah, that's right. He asks me if I want to hear the same story again, and I say yes. Okay, well, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that I wanted to hear about the locomotive once more. I wanted to watch him talk about it when he got that spark in his eyes. Sparkle. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Impey recounts everything in detail. Seeing railroad tracks for the first time, the sound of the steam whistle, the black smoke shooting out, the big black block of steel chugging along powerfully. Impey tells me about his sense of awe. That enormous mass of steel right passed by me. We got stoned down. And its steam's whistle blew away whatever dark, murky thing had been in my heart. And in its place, I felt like there was some kind of weird flame lit within me. It changed my world. I'm not exaggerating the slightest. That's how it went. Wow, wow, wow. That's all I could say. And I went back to my shack. That's when I decided I would somehow make the things I saw with my own hands but I had no idea how it was put together. To begin with, I carved some stone and put something that looked like kind of a locomotive on top of an uneven handmade rails. I'd look at it and wonder, how could the thing move on its own? How does it work? Every day I would think about these things while I watched the locomotive from shadows. Then I forgot when it was. There was one other oddball in the village, an eccentric old man. He was always talking about some crazy things or another, so no one in the village would bother to listen to him. He was the other nuisance of the village, always mumbling something strange to himself. I was also guilty of thinking he was weird, like, whoa, I better not get involved with this guy. And then, one day the old man, he was staring intently at the model I made. 
And I thought, uh oh, this isn't good. There's no telling what he'll do. I hastily tried to cover up my model. But he didn't touch it. Instead, he turned to me and said, Kid, this is a locomotive, isn't it? It was a pretty big shock. I never found out what the name of the thing I was trying to make was until now. But once I heard a word, I couldn't get over how cool it sounded. Then as I stood there in the excitement, the old man said, This model isn't going to run. It doesn't have any access to convey power to the wheels. And it doesn't even have any, it doesn't even have an engine. You want me to show you how to make one? That's what the old man said to me. I mean, how could I say no to that? I jumped up a chance without a second thought. I asked him to please tell me whatever he knew. From that day on, the old man taught me all the different kinds of machines humans make. In the beginning, we made a model steam locomotive. We built it out of handmade parts and other parts we stealthily bought from the human cities. When I saw that tiny locomotive move, I felt the shock, like I've been struck by lightning. Nothing ever compared to the excitement I felt when I first saw the thing move for the first time. The machine I made with my own hands was making moving on its own, puff and smoke. I couldn't think of anything better. That's when I swore to myself that I would become an engineer. I realized that this was it for me. This is how I wanted to live. The old man taught me a lot of techniques and knowledge as he told me about himself. He and I were similar, in the fact in the traditional way of vampire life wasn't for us. Seeking a breath of science for vampires, he had been going in and out of human cities since he was young. He said his dream was to give vampires a scientific foothold on par with the humans. Even though he was no man, when he talked about it, his eyes would sparkle like a child's. But nobody understood what he was trying to do. Before he knew it, he'd given up on everything. He looked so sad and tired. I told him to cheer up because I understood him. Then for some reason, the old man started cracking up. He laughed and laughed and laughed. He laughed so hard he had tears in his eyes. Then he told me a really important plan. He said that it was a special project and that he never told anyone about it before. Vampires are always considered a human technology to do the devil's work and distance themselves from it. But he wanted to prove them wrong. He wanted to show everyone how wonderful science could be. He spoke with such passion. I asked him how he planned to prove it and he laughed and pointed to the sky. He said he was going to the moon. If he accomplished this impossible task, then everyone would understand how marvelous science could be. Even I was skeptical at the time. Whoa, whoa there. You must be dreaming. There's no way you ever make it there. The old man laughed. Science makes the impossible possible. It's the hopes and dreams of the people. It's even possible to reach the moon. He said he couldn't explain it too, explain it too well, but he had the best smile ever. I guess that rubbed up off of me, because before I knew it, I was saying that I would reach the moon myself. The old man smiled and patted me on the head. For some time after that, our days were like that. Those times were a lot of fun. Ooh, we a little young Impey. <laughs> yeah. That looks like him. That's my picture. I wonder how many years ago it was. We built a small cannon. Wait, is that for you? Yeah. We built a small cannon prototype for our moon voyage. We calculated the velocity needed to escape Earth's gravity and the amount of gunpowder that it would take. I guess you could call it our first experiment. I wrote some words on the side of the cannon. The old man looked over and asked what the heck it was, and I said to him, This is the first step towards our dream, right? That's why I told him we should write the name of the development team on it. He rolled his eyes and asked when we became a development team. I fucked up my chest as it, that as of right now, we were a team. The Cannon Club. We're gonna use cans to go with we're gonna use cans to go to the moon, so what better name is there? The team was made up of the old man and me. He laughed and asked me if I couldn't come up with something more creative than that. He said it was so damn childish. How mean. I stayed up all night to come up with that. Yeah, so it seemed like the old man started to get attached to the name. The Cannon Club, after all. Of course, the test craft we shot out of the cannon fell without even reaching the moon. 
So after we retrieved it, we debated over that what we should do next. That was a lot of fun. Then the old man told me something out of the blue. He said that his, that his laugh wasn't too exciting. But I guess it hasn't been too bad since I met you. I guess it hasn't been too bad since I met you. And stuff like that. I got a little embarrassed and said, Stop talking to me like your life's coming to an end or something. I'm already about to die. Yeah, well, he is old. Not. <laughs> he is an elderly gentleman. Maybe. Maybe he was feeling some sort of premonition about it. Enpei signs si slightly and looks at me. So that's pretty much why I'm trying to get to the moon. Wow. That's a wonderful dream. Really? <laughs> I'm glad you think so. Usually when I tell people I want to go to the moon, they just look at me all funny. What's the old man doing now? <laughs> the question just seemed like a natural progression in the conversation to me, but... Enpei falls silent. He looks at the moon with sad, distant eyes. Seeing him this way, my mind leaps to the obvious question. He can't be. Yep, he... he is. He was killed in the war. I'm at a loss for words and don't know what to say to him. To Enpei, the old man was probably closer to him than his own family had been. And he was suddenly taken away. I'm sure Enpei was just as heartbroken as Delhi, whose parents had been killed and the shock must have been great. But Enpei just keeps wearing that same sad expression. I don't really know why the war started. I don't really care at this point. Even though the vampires had the upper hand of battle at the beginning, the table suddenly turned one day. It was the government's poison gas weapon that did it. It didn't matter who you were. Once that thing got to you, you just died. Our village was, complete, was pretty much completely wiped out, except for a handful of people and me, since I was far away at the time. That's when the old man died, too. Goodbyes come so suddenly. I'm sorry, I... Oh no, I'm sorry too. I didn't mean to tell you such a depressing story. What should we do? There's a little there's a little more to the story. Do you want to hear the rest of it? If you don't mind, I'd like to hear everything. He nods and continues talking. And we're gonna stop it right there. We will learn more about Impe in the future episodes, and we'll know what's his favorite. He's gonna ask the Shiryuki, maybe for a kiss. No, it'll be the hardest X you would have fun you would have to press in your life, I imagine. <laughs> yep. So, if you guys would take your cannon and shoot that subscribe button right down below, leave a like and comment if you guys would. And as always, we'll see all of you in the next Star Player One episode. Bye. Bye.